<laughs> Jeepers. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. A lot of games. Uh, I, th I think um, Chicago was, was special because we were away from home. It was really the support of the fans post the match. Everyone stayed in the stadium and, and uh, it, w it was a, a nice fine day. So it was a special time to, to spend a bit of time out in the middle and, and uh, really appreciate how much energy they gave to us, uh, despite us being uh, away in the US. I guess another one would have been France in the World Cup where there was kind of carnage during the game and there was a lot of n negatives for us um, in who we had left uh, at the end of it, but certainly not in the performance. And the cacophony or noise was was fantastic from from the supporters. So they were both away games um, because it's always great in the Aviva. We we get fantastic support, and you know England last year, probably when they were going for the Grand Slam, and it was so noisy um, because. I'm behind plate glass that's that's very thick, but even that was starting to to reverberate with the the sound that was in the stadium. Yeah, I, I think they are. I, having grown up in New Zealand, I think New Zealand fans, uh, yeah, they applaud and they they express themselves. But I think over here, um, when I first came to Claremont, they they would they would chant and sing and. Uh, and, and that was different, and it's a bit the same here in Ireland as well, where you know, I, I know in Claremont they would say, Kina sorte pa, ne pazel vanya, and they would jump up and down because what they're saying is, he who does not jump is not from the Orvian, which is where we were from. So, so everyone got up and, and the whole stadium would actually rock um, with it. And, uh, you know, in in Leinster, they, they they start ramping up to come on the boys in blue and and, and really enjoyed that and I, I just don't think you can well the, the Welsh with breathe of heaven the, the us um, here with fields of Athen Rye I, I, I think um, the, you know the Scots with flower of Scotland they're all kind of quite magical when you when you're in those stadiums and and those uh, and and those expressions of support start up. Um, and, and probably the other thing that was unbelievably different when I, I first came to Ireland was how quiet everyone is when there's a kick at goal. Uh, there's a real respect in the fans over here that probably, you know, as much as, you know, you would, you would want that everywhere, it, it, it's, I think it's one of the best places that I've been um, here where there is that respect and, and you give the kicker a, a real opportunity. In Claremont, the, they used to clap, slow clap the kicker and faster and faster, a bit like those long jumpers in the Olympics. And um, you know, when Brock James or Morgan Parra were taking a goal kick, that was what their expression of support was. It wasn't the dead silence, it was, it was that support building up to the crescendo that was the kicker goal. Yeah, that's an interesting question because there, there, there was a real kind of uh, spread of people. I think there was a guy, uh, Bruce Robertson, was a, an all-black centre at the time. He, he was inspiring because when I was young, I was playing centre and he, um, he was just class as a player. And I, I think the other one was probably BG Williams just because he was, um, he was so robust and, and so effective for the All Blacks. So growing up, they were the guys that you saw um, kind of on TV and, and, and aspired to be, you know, uh, one day as good as or, 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 uh, or to meet them or to see them play. I'm sure that there are some, some funny moments. I think one of the things that, uh, that happens out here is that we, we have people who come and watch us train and uh, there's uh, one, one young girl who, who comes out reasonably often, Jennifer, um, and sh she almost tackled me over one day <laughs> when she flew across the road, hit me uh, hard and low um, and said, just be careful crossing the road. And I thought, wow, I, I just got to be careful when you, when you, you come in for your tackle. But um, she was also the, the young girl who Pete gave her, his, uh, his Grand Slam Six Nations medal to um, after the game. Uh, yeah. 
on March 17 in, in Twickenham. So um, she, she's a fan that, that is just pure exuberance. It's probably easier than people think once you get to know the players and I, I, I tend to leave them in their own space. They, at this level of their career, uh, most of them know themselves pretty well, that they, they build themselves into the game and, and their, their mindset. You know, they're so consistent in, in delivering a, a, a really competitive mindset and they, they kind of know how to do it themselves. Some like to ramp themselves up, others. Uh, are very placid, very calm. Uh, a lot like to listen to a, a little bit of music to either calm them, calm themselves down, or, or, or to ramp themselves up. And so you tend to leave them because it's a. I think it's an individual thing. It, certainly collectively, you want them to come together with a, a very uh, collective, combative mindset. But how they arrive at that is quite individual. They, they would tend to stick to one routine for, for all the games. Um, and it, there's little things that might change, um, but in the, in the main, because there's a real rhythm to our day, uh, we meet four hours out from kickoff and we, we have a bit of a chat about what we want to make sure we, we achieve. Uh, the lads throw the ball around a little bit in a, in a little game they play, probably just to, to relieve a little bit of that real nervous tension that's starting to build um, and, and then we have a, a pre-match meal and then from there on they, they're pretty much consistent in what they do. Some will have a little bit of a, a, a nap, others will um, kind of sit around and have a bit of a chat and talk about anything but the game and then once it gets to about 90 minutes before kickoff when we get on the bus usually to arrive about 10 minutes later, it's, it's very similar. And, and standing in the changing room, you see players doing very similar things. Players come out onto the pitch at a very similar time. You know, some come out very late, um, just before the team warm up. Others go out early, particularly the kickers, um, and go through a little bit more of a, a, a routine. So. Yeah, I, I think anyone who, who's observed the players coming out to warm up will see that it's very regular um, in, in, what they, in what time they come out and then what they do when they get out there. There probably is. Um, I, I'm, I'm only really a tactician. I, I don't go big in the motivational speech uh, area because I, I think you try to stick to what you're maybe um, good at and the motivational speech often comes from a, you know from one of the leaders a, a Rory Best, a Pete Omani, a Johnny Sexton, um, Jamie Heaslip would have uh, would have said a few things. Obviously, Paul O'Connell was is pretty inspirational, motivational um, speaker. Uh, I mean, a few few words, but uh, I think even they would have a little bit of tactical information amongst that, that motivation because there's, you don't want a whole lot of energy um, being coiled, ready to be expressed without some direction in the manner it's going to be expressed. So the players are very good at, at, at leading themselves there, so I can stick to my own gravy a little bit there. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes. I, I got to know Drico pretty well, and he, he, you know, uh, Leo was captain when I was in, in Leinster, but, but Drico would certainly have been one of the guys who would have spoken, and guys like Shane Jennings and, and those kind of probably unsung heroes of the team like Geno would often express themselves really well before a game, and, and it's the same uh, with Ireland. Occasionally, I'm, I'm, I might chat to, to Rory or Johnny, or Pete, um, just about what I think we might need today, or, or e even uh, tactically, I might say something to Robbie Henshaw and just say, "Hey, Robbie, can you drive this message?" Or Andy Farrell might uh, say that, or Simon Easterby might give a message to one of the forwards to to drive something specific. So that when those players are motivating the other players or directing them, that 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 some of it is in line with what we've planned to do.
certainly from um, the environment that we're going into is going to be very different. The first thing is we're going to try to manage as best we can the time the time difference. Um, it's not how far we have to travel. When we went down to South Africa in the Southern Hemisphere there, it's it's quite painless really. It's just a long flight, but you're in the, a very similar time zone. Going across to Australia, I think uh, Brisbane, there's a nine hour uh, time difference. Um, and so, you know, to, to adjust to that very quickly, and even on top of that, then our kickoff times are at 8.05. So that's probably been one of the challenges that we've been talking about trying to manage as best we can. And then um, just, you don't have the advantages of, of being at home. You know, we like being here. We like, uh, you, you get into a routine here that um, you have to travel to training bases. So everything, just the day gets a little bit longer when you're, when you're away from uh, your own training base. And Six Nations, you've, we tend to fly on a Thursday evening. So you're at home for the rest of that time. So going away, uh, the other bonus that it has is, is it creates uh, a fantastic opportunity for shared experiences for players. You know, they get together and they they, they go in. Uh, last time we were in Japan last year, uh, we went to a sumo school and watched them train. And, you know, you just don't get a chance to do that normally. And then it becomes a bit of a talking point and it's a shared experience and it helps the group kind of gel together a little bit more without it being rugby focused. Yeah, that's a really good question because um, did, did I enjoy the end game in France? No, I was on the edge of my seat like everyone else. Um, did I enjoy uh, the moment when we saw the ball had crossed the, crossed the crossbar and uh, successfully scored? I certainly enjoyed that end game. I, I suppose when, when you look at games, um, I, I enjoyed the last three minutes in Chicago. Because when three minutes are only three minutes are left and you've got an eleven point lead, you know they can't really win. And uh, we were actually lining up a shot at goal at that time, so that's another minute probably gone. Plus we might add to our lead, which we didn't. But I didn't really care. Um, and it was a bit like that in Twickenham on St Patrick's Day. You know, with a great Irish crowd in the in the stadium. Um, yeah, they scored in the first or second minute of injury time, but it wasn't even going to get them close enough to, to, to be within a score in the end. Um, so we could enjoy that last little bit, even though we were still trying to thaw out. It was minus five degrees. For a, a March mid-March game, it was probably the coldest I've been. I think you can only you can only use resources for a certain amount of time. They're, they're not fine, they're not infinite. There was a finite period that we could retain the ball against a, a really good French defensive side. Um, they were making it very tough to get progress. We had to break it up, but it got like trench warfare for a while, and the cross kick went across to Keith Earls. That gave us a little bit of breathing space again, and then Ian Henderson on the back of that got, it was another good carry, but. I know that Johnny's got that range. I've seen him hit them. Why not there? He's straight out in front as opposed to trying to go further. And that I don't think people realise how, how slippery the conditions were as well. Um, on TV, it always looks a little bit better than it is in real life. And it was very greasy. And to try to maintain the position that we'd had for 41 phases, five minutes and 15 seconds, but, I think it was the dead right decision. Um, and it's easy to say that in retrospect, isn't it? Because it did have the distance and it did go between the uprights. I'd encourage them to play any team sport. Um, you know, it, all my kids have played team sports and yes, my son plays rugby and he's, he, you know, he really enjoys it. He's got mates that he will have for life. You, because I think there's still some really good values in rugby um, and the, the commitment to each other is, is it has to be uh, pretty unequivocal because you're actually looking after somebody who's being knocked backwards. 
you have to put your body in the line on the line to, to kind of protect them so it, it builds those those bonds um, to be quite close and I know um, after the Australian tour I'll go back for a couple of weeks to New Zealand to see family and and friends and some of those friends will be the guys that I played rugby with in school um, just because that, that's the bond you form um, and you you make friendships for life. You, you understand what being a team player is all about, and and you try to try to make sure that you you bring those values to life in in a broader sense. So, um, I, I I love the game. So it's easy for me to say to to parents. I know that there's some risks involved in the game, as as there are in 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 most sports. Um, you know, I I, I think um, you know even. Even talking to golfers and and guys who play less um, active sports and certainly not confrontational physical sports, they still get um, injuries at times and they don't have the the same opportunity to to kind of share their sporting experience uh, as closely. There's there's nothing better than being in a winning dressing room when you've had to work as hard as you possibly can to get there and um, you know being in the dressing room post that France game that we just talked about is, yeah, I think those players won't won't forget that in a hurry. And I think part of that then led to them doing what they did to, to finish the Grand Slam because to put that investment in, you want to get some, some, some return on that investment. There's, there's all sorts of people I found inspiring from my, um, you know, from my experiences. Um, there was a guy in Cahoon uh, who who coached me at club level, um, um, who who was just so meticulous in his in his planning and um, would would be insistent on us getting things perfect. It wasn't good enough just to be good at it; you had to be perfect at it. And um, I suppose that's that's part of a driver um, for for me to to keep driving that with with players because once the player adopts that challenge I, I think um, I think you can be more successful and and even I watch other coaches you know Jurgen Klopp um, he put he appears to me and I don't know him to put so much energy in um, that uh, you know that energy is probably a catalyst for his players to to, to demonstrate the same energy um, I, I know Arsene Wenger a little bit and, and having gone and to Arsenal, um, just he's meticulous. Um, and again, I suppose you, you're looking to pick little things up all the time. Uh, even even here, meeting up with Martin O'Neill or Michael O'Neill or, or Jim Gavin or Pat Gilroy, um, you, you meet those people and, and you, you chat to them about um, what's happening currently in the game. Um, watching videos of Pep Guardiola um, coaching, honestly, he, he must be pretty fit. He was jumping around as much as the players, um, but bringing that real energy to, to what he was doing. So I'd say, I'd say there's, there's just so many um, because I, I, I still I'm, I'm looking to learn from whoever's coaching. And, and even uh, I was watching a guy, I, I was speaking at a conference recently, and, and he was talking about all, all sorts of different ways to motivate people, but also to appreciate what they do and to recognise uh, the achievement that they've made. And um, you, you take little snippets all the time. The most frustrating aspect for most people is the scrummage, because when, when you set the scrum and it goes down and you reset it and it goes down, and then suddenly two minutes have been chewed through that people want to see the game being played, not the game being attempted to be restarted. So uh, I think um, they have had a number of looks at the scrum and I think it's got better. And I, I know statistically that we are very correct in what we do and, and our percentages probably top the percentages for using the scrum just to get the game underway and started. And so um, I think I think part of it is incumbent not just on those people looking at the game, but those people involved in the game to try to make those parts of the game, which are a little bit special. No one has 
the scrum like a rugby union scrum. A rugby league have it, but it's flicked in and out. Rugby union scrum is a real contest. It's a real physical contest for the combatants involved. And, and if we want to retain that, we've got to try to solve any, any problems that are within it. Um, <laughs> my kids would probably say I don't relax. <laughs> I, um, I tend to be a little bit, uh, you know, intense. I know, I know with the players, I, I tend to try to stay away from them a little bit because I, I know I'm intense. But um, I, I probably try to get a little bit of, on a Sunday morning, uh, for an hour, I, I try to play a bit of pitch and putt at, at the Castle Golf Club, which is around the corner from, from where I live. Um, I've got a, a, a young fellow who struggles a little bit, and it's he, he's he's in in great form at the moment. And so we sneak down and maybe play six, nine, maybe even twelve if things are going well. Um, holes a pitch and putt, and and that would that's a great kind of de-stressor for me. It's it's and it's it's a it's a, a nice time to spend uh, you know with uh, with family. Um, and I suppose the other times are. We try to have meal times, although it's getting more and more difficult with older kids. But we we tried to protect meal times a little bit, and uh, there's you know there's no phones, there's no um, nothing other than than a little bit of uh, family banter really. Um, so that there's that, and hell, apart from that, um, I, I I like watching other sport, um, and I, I don't get um, you know I don't take too many sides in it. I, I just enjoy really high level contests, whether it's Roland Garros at, at the moment or or um, having watched a bit of the, the Players' Championship last week. I, I don't often get a chance to do it, but it's a very different pace to what I normally have to do. So it's nice to, to sit down and, and do a bit of that. <laughs> Jeepers. Um, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I'd probably pick a retired rugby player because they, I, I, I couldn't keep up with these young guys. They, they would, um, they'd be, uh, they'd be going too fast for me. So I'd, I'd want to take a road trip in my own time at my own speed. So I'd probably pick, um, you know, probably one of the players I played with and and uh, and head off and and kind of enjoy a nice slow road trip and. To be honest, I'd, 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 I'd probably rather take my wife, we spend little enough time together as it is, to go and spend more time with a rugby player, I, I just probably would try to avoid it, to be honest. Where would you like to go? If you were um, I, I think uh, I, I've, I've seen a lot of the South Island of New Zealand, um, but I'd, I'd I'd love to go on a road trip with my wife in the South Island of New Zealand. We always lived in the north, I was born in the far north, so it's one of those things that we keep talking about getting around to so um but every time i go back to new zealand she's in ireland and and vice versa so um it's not like we get back there at the same time too often we did a a great road trip around ireland 25 years ago and a great road trip around europe 25 years ago when we came over as probably pretty young people without kids pre-kids so you had a lot more flexibility in a um yeah, and we probably went a little bit faster then. I'd, I'd like to just slow down and, and, and um, probably take a bit of time around a, a road trip. And I'd quite happily go back around Europe, back around Ireland, because we, we thoroughly enjoyed it when we did do it. Wow. You know what? Um, it's probably the, the worst memory, uh, one of the worst memories. It's, it's probably Ryan Crotty scoring against us in 2013. Um, you talk about the fans that day, they were unbelievable in the Aviva. There was just this cacophony of support for us and with probably 25 seconds of the match to go, we we get penalised and, and the All Blacks managed to, you know, Bowden Barrett did a great job, um, kind of half getting through a gap and Liam Messam down the right hand side. Um, I, it's the most memorable because I can just see it all happening, unfolding again. And um, do I want that memory? I'd, I'd love to. And it's partially extinguished by what happened in Chicago, thankfully. But um, it's, 
unfortunately, probably still the most the most memorable. Um, but hopefully, there's some memories that will still be built going forward in, in the next 18 months and in, in the lead up to um, to Japan. So we'll we'll see what happens.